What sort of promise was this? What sort of Messiah had come? That in the hands of mere men, his life would succumb? What happened to the miracles? What happened to calming the waves? Now there's only darkness surrounding, and there's hell to be paid. It wasn't supposed to end this way. He had only just begun, and the prophecy told us he was supposed to be the one. The one who bring freedom from these laws like prison chains. The one who reconciled the people by the power of his name. Yet here he is, betrayed and deserted on a cross. And after crying out to his father, even he seems lost. And as he exhaled his last, the whole earth shook in a rage. The veil was ravaged and the savior was slain. But lo, in the grave he would not stay. For death could not hold the Savior at bay. For the darkest of night comes just before dawn. And with the next breath he took, the Messiah had won. And as he emerged from that tomb, no longer a slave to the darkness that swore it would swallow his name, the cords of his death trembled, retreated, and cowered, his sentence repealed by the evidence of his power. And behold, a new age dawned of redemption through grace, where the stains of our sins could no longer be traced, forever washed clean by the blood that he shed, made new in the life that was raised from the dead. And what do we have to do to receive such a prize? Simply call on his name and open our eyes for his name is the name that changes our story when our tongues profess the name of the king of glory and not herod not judas not a roman or high priest not a tempter not a serpent not the rugged corpse of a tree could ever stop ever stall any part of his plan for his name is jesus the great i am Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Calvary Chapel. Um, as you come in through the doors, you've got this yellow piece of paper that has our, our guidelines for our services. We're going to continue to have services from this point on. And of course, we're going to exercise all kinds of uh, safety precautions, you know, the hand sanitizer and those type of things. According to the CDC and the uh, state, of, uh, state of Missouri ordinances, we can have up to 55 people based upon the square footage that we have. So if we start pressing above 55 people, what we'll do is simply have two services. Um, but I think we'll remain safe. So we'll continue to have that, uh, our services from this point out. And uh, we just ask that one of the things that's not on your piece of paper is that we want your children to remain with you and not up moving about. And we won't have any uh, nursery services nor children's services until this epidemic is over. So uh, with that... Uh, how many is ready to praise the Lord this morning? Because he is risen. Amen? Amen. All right, let's, uh, let's all stand up. Let's all lift up our voices. And uh, Oh, one other thing. As we exit after the service this morning, we'll go through these double doors here. We'll have someone open those up. And there's Easter baskets for all the children as we go out. You can pick up, what, pick up as many as you want. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I thought you said no there for a second. Why not? <laughs> so yeah, there's plenty of Easter baskets. So pick up the Easter baskets as you go through the double doors there and exit that out through the coffee shop. But other, other than that, let's uh, lift up a word of prayer and then invite Jesus in. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you. Uh, we thank you for the hope that we have in the resurrection. We thank you for your spirit who you've given us to, to combat the fear that some of us are experiencing. We know that there's no... A condemnation for those that's in Christ Jesus. We know that we have the hope of heaven. And so, Lord, we also know that there's no reason to fear. We just ask that your spirit continue to be upon us, comforting us, leading us, and guiding us in all things that are of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 <coughs> Oh, happy. 
happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. When my Jesus washed. When Jesus washed. He washed my sins away. He washed my sins away. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. My Jesus washed. Jesus washed. He washed my sins away. Yes, he he washed my sins away. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. When my Jesus washed. When Jesus washed. He washed my sins away. He washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch, watch and pray, night and day. He taught me how to live and rejoice every day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. When my Jesus washed. When Jesus washed. He washed my sins away. Everybody put your hands together. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. When my Jesus washed. When Jesus washed. He washed my sins away. He washed my sins away. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. When my Jesus washed. When Jesus washed. He washed my sins away. He washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch, watch and pray. Night and day. He taught me Happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. When my Jesus washed. When Jesus washed. He washed my sins away. He washed my sins away. He taught me how to watch, watch and pray. Night and day. He taught me how. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this happy day that you've given us, this day of resurrection, the day that you walked out of the grave. For we know because you walked out of the grave, all of our sins are dealt with, that we now have eternal life in you. So Lord, as we gather here this morning, as we lift up our voices again, we ask that you pour out your spirit. Pour out your spirit of peace and joy and comfort, of patience, of goodness, of faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Lord, we want more of you. We want to experience all the riches that we have in you. So, Lord, we lift up our voices, and as we do so, again, we ask that you pour out your spirit. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm on my knees again. 
God, I'm begging please again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these desert roads, water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Your forgiveness, like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. The sound of a symphony to my ears I holy water on my skin I holy water on my skin Dead men walking slave to sin I want to know about being born again I need you God, I need you Take me to the riverside Take me under baptized I need you God, I need you Your forgiveness Is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips like the sound of a symphony to my ears Like holy water on my skin Like holy water on my skin I don't want to abuse your grace God, I need you every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need you every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need you every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Your forgiveness Like sweet, sweet honey on my lips Like the sound of a symphony to my ears Like holy water on my skin Like holy water on my skin Like holy water on my skin Lord, because you have gifted us with life, we desire to gift you in return. Lord, we come together this morning to worship you, to thank you, to acknowledge the life that we have in you. So, Lord, we come with our gift in our hand. We give it to you as we give treasure into heaven because that's where we want our hearts to be. That's what your word says. Where wherever our treasure is, there our hearts will also be. So we give you a piece of our hearts this morning. Not under compulsion of man, not based upon percentages, but based upon our love for you. And it's in Jesus' name we do so. Amen. <coughs> To prison, 
I've worn shackles and chains, but I've been freed and forgiven. I'm not going back. I'll never be the same. That's why I sing. Oh, my hope is in Jesus. Thank God my yesterday's gone. Oh, my sins are forgiven. I've been washed by the blood. There's a kind of thing that just breaks a man. It breaks him down to his knees. God, I've been broken more than a time or two. Yes, Lord. Then he picked me up and showed me what it means to be a man. Come on and sing. Oh, my hope is in Jesus. Thank God my yesterday is gone. All my sins are forgiven. I've been washed by the blood. I've been washed by the blood. Amen. I'm no longer a slave of fear. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. You unravel me with your melody. You surround me with song of deliverance from my enemy till all my fears are gone I'm no longer slave to fear I am a child of God I'm no longer chosen me your love has called my name I've been born again in your family your blood flows through my veins I'm no longer slave to fear I am a child I'm no longer slave to fear. I am a child of God. You split the sea so I could walk right through it. My fears were drowned in perfect love. You rescued me. So I could stand and sing I am a child of God You split the sea So I could walk right through it My fears were drowned in perfect love You rescued 
rescued me so I could stand and sing. I am a child of God. I am a child. I am a child. I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave of fear. Amen. <clears throat> I prayed this morning for, I'm, I'm sorry, Brian, I, I, I can't, I got to say something. I prayed this morning, I was sitting in my house drinking coffee, and I said, Lord, this is a special day for us and for you, and what this day represents is freedom and assurance and eternal life and everything, because not only did he come and live a perfect life that we couldn't live, but he died in our place, and that he took his life back up again, it all fastens and anchors in this resurrection today. And I said, Lord, if there's any way that you could join our hearts as one and help us to sing in such a way that it would bring tears of joy to your eyes while you're sitting on your throne this morning, this is what we desire, is that we could sing beautifully and bless you today, Lord, and let your heart feel the warmth of our love and our adoration for you. And so uh, join your hearts with us as we worship the Lord right here because it's all about him, ladies yes. and gentlemen. It's, yes. it's all about him and what he's done and what he continues to do. <coughs> the nails in my hands laugh at me where you stand go ahead and say it isn't me they will come when you will see cause I rise again ain't no power on earth can tie me down. Yes, I'll rise again. Death can't keep me in the ground. Go ahead. Go on and mock my name. My love for you still the same. Go ahead, try to bury me, but very soon I will be free, cause I'll rise again, ain't no power on earth can tie me down, yes I'll rise very soon go ahead try to hide the sun you all will see that I'm the one cause I'll rise again ain't no power on earth can tie me down Yes, I'll rise again. Death can't keep me in the ground. Yes, I'll rise again. Ain't no power on earth can tie me down. Yes, I'll rise. Go ahead, 
say I'm dead and gone you will see that you were wrong go ahead try to hide the sun you all will see that I'm the one cause I'll rise again ain't no power on earth can tie me down yes I'll rise again death can't keep me in the ground Yes, I'll come again Come to take my people back Come to take my people back Sit here, sit out there, wherever you want to sit. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 24. I'm sorry, chapter 28 is the worship team takes a seat. Matthew chapter 28. We'll be picking up at verse 1. Um, basically, because I'm so used to doing verse-by-verse -verse teachings, I rarely do a topical teaching. And... and uh, what we're doing one this morning, of course, concerning the resurrection, and the Lord's just giving me a four-point outline. I really have no idea where we're going to go. <laughs> I do have the scripture references set aside, but basically we're going to be looking at the resurrection, the promise, the response, and the blessing. The resurrection, the promise, the response, and the blessing. And so we're going to start off with the resurrection. <laughs> Now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. That, wouldn't that have been a sight? <laughs> you know, the stone's been rolled away, away and you come up and there's an angel sitting there, sitting up on that, so, that stone. Uh, and his appearance was like lightning. I'm reminded of when Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration. The Father had said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I'm well pleased. And we're told that his appearance was like lightning, he, that he was white as snow. His garments was white as snow. So white that even Calgon could not have made him as white, you know? Don't, that goes way back, <laughs> apparently. And y'all are not hearing it this morning. Maybe I'm just a little too old. <laughs> I'm just totally blowing the scripture, aren't I? The guard shook for fear of him, of, of him, the angel, and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, <laughs> just as he said. Come see the place where he was laying. Go quickly, tell the disciples and he, that he has risen from the, from the dead. And behold, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I've told you, I'm an angel of the Lord. What I say is true. So there's the resurrection. The resurrection, if you can believe it, if you can really lay hold of it, if you have believed it, if you have laid hold of it, there should be no fear in your hearts today. And I'm talking about even this coronavirus that's going around. There should be no fear. Yes, we take precautions because that's what our authority, government authorities are saying we should do. And we are concerned about people's well-being. But we should not be motivated by, motivated by fear. There should be a peace in your heart that surpasses all understanding because He is risen. He's risen. The promise has been fulfilled. The promise that was made back in Genesis chapter 1. Where, the, where Adam and Eve, they were in this perfect garden paradise. And by the way, that's where we're headed. We're headed to a perfect garden paradise. There, in that perfect garden paradise, God walked with man, talked with man, communed with man. He had a love relationship with man. 
That's what he wanted. And he wants us to freely come into a relationship with him. That's why a lot of people ask, why did he put that tree in the center of the Garden of Eden? That tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because he wanted us to be able to choose to be in a relationship with him. You know, I, and when I met Tammy and I fell in love with her, I could have tied her up and, and, and threw her into a basin and said, I'm not going to let you out until you say I love you. She might have said I love you, but does she mean it? Probably not. She just wants out of the dungeon, right? God wants us to be able to choose him. That's why he placed the, knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the center of that garden paradise. He wants us to choose him. So in effect, what God said to Adam, Adam, you and I are now in this awesome relationship. You have everything you could possibly want or dream of. You have it right here in this garden. But I want you to be able to choose to be in a relationship with me. Therefore, if you want to sever the relationship you and I now have, just eat of that tree. But I warn you, it will be death. It will be death. And that's where we're at now. We all come from God. We've all been separated from God. We all, when we're born, we're born into death, separated from God. Not based upon anything we've done. The moment we were conceived, we were headed for death. We were separated from God. The promise that God made to Adam. Adam, I should probably turn off my phone, right? <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> By the way, you should turn your phones down. <laughs> I forgot where I was at. <laughs> Of the promise. Okay, yes, he said, I promise you, I'm going to bring you back into a love relationship. And so that was the promise. And so, but a, as he made this promise, we find two different kinds of people, basically two kinds of people, those who believe God, those who don't believe God. Those who believe God are going to embrace that promise. They're going to embrace the resurrection. They're going to embrace that promise. And those who do not believe in God, they're going to try to approach him through some sort of religious system, or they're going to go into the world and seek satisf satisfaction and fulfillment. But basically, what we have are two kinds of people, the believer, the non-believer. And it's all based upon that promise. Turn with me to Genesis chapter, um, chapter 5. There we find these two kinds of people. This is now the man... No, I'm sorry, Genesis chapter 4. Trick. I tricked you there, didn't I? That's not actually a 5, that's an S. I, my handwriting is so bad, I can't even read it. Genesis chapter 4. This is the man had relations with his wife Eve, and she conceived and gave birth to Cain, and, and said, I have gotten a man-child with the help of the Lord. Again, she gave birth to his brother Abel. And Abel was a keeper of the flocks, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. So it came about over the course of time. So there was this, this time they've been separated from God. They've been cast out from the presence of God. I can imagine what they might have been thinking because they were probably looking for the fulfillment, immediate fulfillment of that promise. So they've been waiting, they've been waiting. When is God going to give us that child, that lamb that's going to take away the sin of, a, of the world? When is he going to do that? And so we see one of them, because there's, of course, of time, has grown impatient. We have the believer, and then we have the impatient one now, right? So, we, and so say, it came about in the course of time that Cain brought an offering to the Lord from the fruit of the ground. So Cain, I can imagine, he says, man, when's God going to fill this promise? So he's, he, he says, I know what I'll do. I'll go out and I'll do something. I'm going to impress God. This is what I'm going to do. I'm going to go out in the field. I'm going to work. I'm going to labor. I'm going I'm to till up the ground. I'm going to plant some seed. And then this is what I'll do. I'll harvest that fruit and I'll take it to God because I'm going to bless him. I'm going to show him that I can, you know, I can impress him. I can appease him. So he brings the fruit of the ground. He brings the work of his hands. That's what he's bringing. I'll bring God some work. I'll really impress him. I'll show him that I can deal with my sin. But for Cain, I'm sorry, Abel, Abel brought the, 
Verse 4, Abel, on his part, also brought the firstlings of his flock and the fat of their portions. And the, the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering, but for Cain and for his offering, he had no regard. So Cain became angry. So here's Abel. He brought the lamb, brought a lamb. He lays it at the entrance of the garden. And it, we're told that God appreciated, he had regard for that, that offering that Abel brought. Now, think about that. Cain worked, he labored, he, there was sweat coming from his brow. He really worked hard for this. And, it, and he brings this, this sacrifice and he lays it at God's feet or at the entrance of the garden and expecting that God would appreciate this. God says, no, I don't want that. But then here comes Abel. He butchers a lamb. He brings it and lays it at the entrance of the garden. God says, man, I really appreciate that. Thank you. What's the difference here? Attitude, belief. One believed, the other did not believe. Which speaks of a lot of people today that come into a church service. They come in and say, you know what, I'm going to impress God to get today. I'm going to write a check for $1,000. I'm going to drop it into the... My phone just went off again. Anyway. <laughs> I'm going to... I'm going to write a check and I'm really going to pray hard this week. I'm going to impress God with all my work, all my activity. I'm just really going to impress Him. God's really going to love me because of all the things I'm doing for Him. That's Cain. He's trying to impress God. If that is you, God does not have regard for that. Now, if you come in, you've been praying all week, You've been seeking the Lord all week. You come in, you write a check, you drop it into the basket. You lift up your hands, you worship God. You did the exact same thing as Cain did, the religious person did. God will be blessed by it. What's the difference? One is a believer and the other is a religious person. One's a trying to approach God through a religious system. If I do this, that, and the other... God's going to be impressed with me. The able, as we're told in the he, by the Hebrew writer, the able <clears throat> believes God. His faith is in God. He trusts in God. No matter what's happening, his faith is in God. Yes, God may be delaying his coming because we're all looking for that rapture to take place, but his faith remains in God. He trusts in what God's doing. And when he brings that sacrifice... He's, all he's saying is, God, you made this promise to me. You've, done, you've, you, you've dealt with my sin. I love you, and I just want to say thank you. You see the difference there? One's belief and one's unbelief. That's what we're doing here. And so, But over the course of time, as we read here, the world... Let me finish this verse here real quick, though. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? And why has your countenance fallen? Your countenance. Why is your why, why, why are you angry? God knew why he was angry. He was upset because God had accepted Abel's sacrifice, but not his. And he says, why are you angry? Think this through with me. Think about this. Why are you angry, Cain? And he says, why has your countenance fallen? Why are you so bummed out? Why are you depressed? Why are you upset? Why are you bummed out? Of course, he wants Cain to think about his actions here. And this is what he goes on. He said, if you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? If you do well, how do we do well? The disciples asked that same question one day. Master, how can we do the works of God? How, how can we bless God? In other words, Jesus said, go to church. Read your Bibles. Pray. Do this, that, and the other. No. He didn't say any of that. He says there's only one thing. One thing that you can do. One thing. Believe in the one the Father has sent. Believe in Him. That's the only thing you can do. 
to pray. Now, there's a lot of things that follow my belief. My actions will follow my belief. I'm going to, because I want to draw near to this one who's dealt with my sin. I want to draw near to Jesus. I'm going to be in his word. I'm going to communicate with him through prayer. I'm going to seek to bless him in everything that he's doing. I'm going to lift up praise and thanksgiving to him because I believe him. That's what God is saying. If you do will, will not your counsel. If you would just simply believe in the promise I made, you will do well. Your countenance will be lifted up. And sure enough, that's what happened in my life. My countenance was lifted up. When I gave my heart to Jesus and said, Lord, I believe in your word. I believe in a resurrection. I believe in your promises. My countenance was lifted up. I was lifted up out of this deep, dark hole of a life. And this darkness, this disparity, this depression, he lifted me up out of that when I simply chose to believe in him. That's our response. We're either going to respond to the way of Cain or the way of Abel. Now you might be saying, well, why is there this Old Testament law? Why is all this stuff written in the Old Testament? Because man was de determined to preach or to reach God through a religious system. Man was de demanding a religious system. For 2,000 years, man kept, took the, they went the way of Cain, as Jude would write. He, they went the way of religion, trying to reach God through a religious system because they wouldn't believe him when he says, I, I have forgiven you. They wouldn't believe that. So they, they turned to religion. And so for 2,000 years, man approached God through a religious system. Then finally God says, okay, okay. If you are so determined to approach me through a religious system, this is what it's going to take. So he taps Moses on the law or on the shoulder. He gives him the law. And he says, if you really think that you can approach me through a religious system, this is what it's going to take. You're going to have to follow this diet. You're going to have to follow these rules, rites, and rig rituals, these regulations. And by the way, if a, if a Gentile comes into your land, you're going to have to kill him because you have to be perfect. That's what the law demands, perfection. But Jesus would go on to say, you search the Scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life, but it is these that give testimony of me. The law, Jesus said, listen, listen, listen. The law is not telling you what you must do. The law is actually saying what you cannot do. You see, the, the Pharisees in that day, when Jesus was preaching this to them, they believed that if they followed the rules, rites, and rituals, and regulations, that they could be perfect. Well, here's the deal. If you break one single rule, one single rule, if you sin one time, then you have to account for that. We sin in our thoughts. We sin in our actions. We sin in our lives every single hour. You'd be constantly making sacrifices to God. So the law's not telling you what you must do. The law is actually saying what you cannot do. And what's the solution to the law? Believing in Jesus. That's what he said. You search the Scriptures because you think in them you have eternal life. But it is these that point you to me. That's what Paul wrote in the book of Galatians. Listen to this. Galatians chapter 3. <laughs> Before faith came, faith in what? Jesus, right? He died for our sins. But listen to this. Before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law. We were under a law. We were under rules, rights, and rituals, and regulations, and guidelines, and diets. You were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law became a tutor. The law was a teacher to lead us to Christ. The purpose of the law was not to condemn us. It was there to convict us, to say, hey, you cannot live under a law, but to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. Faith in what? The promise that God made in Genesis. 
The promise he made, I will deal with your sin issue. I will provide a lamb. But now that faith has come, listen, but now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. What's the tutor? The law. We're no longer under a religious system. Paul says now the faith that, or I'm sorry, the life that I now live in the flesh, because I'm a dirty, rotten sinner, I live by faith in Jesus Christ. I live by faith. Now, I don't go out intentionally sin, but I am a sinner. I fail. I make mistakes, but I, I know that Jesus has dealt with that. So the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith. This is what God desires for us. He wants this response. What is the response He wants from us? Belief. He wants us to believe in the resurrection because the resurrection is the proof that Jesus, rising from the grave, is the proof that God has forgiven sin. That God stepped out of heaven, entered into a man, the form of a man, and goes to the cross and, and dies for our sin. The resurrection says... That is God. Jesus said, destroy this temple. And in three days, I will raise it up. In three days, I will raise it up. He's God. And God has forgiven sin. Finally, wrapping this up, we'll go to Genesis, I'm sorry, Ephesians. Chapter 1, verse 3. How many of you want to bless God? I want to bless God. Because he, He's blessed me, right? What can we do to bless God? Listen to this. Blessed be the God and the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us. See, God is blessed when you recognize He's blessed you. When, he's, when you recognize that He's given you every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places that you can have. What, are, what is man seeking? He's looking for satisfaction. He's looking for fulfillment. He's looking for peace and joy and happiness. That's what man is seeking. That's what we're striving and straining for. We're, we're looking to be satisfied. We're looking to be fulfilled. Blessed is our God and Father who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. God is blessed when we acknowledge, when we accept the fact that He has already blessed us with everything concerning eternal life, concerning the riches of, of heaven. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Chose us in Jesus before the foundation of the world. Wait, Jesus was, Jesus was crucified 2,000 years ago. How could he chose us in him before the, uh, 2000, before the foundation of the world? The answer to that question goes back to Genesis. Forgiveness was already available to all of us. All we had to do was believe in the promise. See, God already had a plan. He knew that man was going to turn his back upon him. He knew that man was going to sin. He said, but you know what? I will forgive them. Oh. God demonstrates us. I can't remember the verse number here, so I'm just going to quote it. God demonstrates his love toward us. And while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you hear the words there? God demonstrates his forgiveness. He demonstrates it. You see, the, what happened upon the cross of Calvary was simply a demonstration of what God has already done. When we sinned against Him, it, 
tore him up. It crucified him. It, it's, it, we hurt him. You see, when we sinned against him, when Adam sinned against God, he was crucified then and there. But God says, I will forgive. The cross is a demonstration of what took place back in the Garden of Eden when man first turned his back upon him. You see that? It was simply a demonstration. God loved man. God had a, 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 such a great love for him that he was willing to forgive every blasphemous word, every action, every thought. We, every time we turn our back against, he says, I love you. See how great a love the Father has bestowed on us that we would be called children of, of God, John wrote. See how great a love. Look at the love. Look at the cross. That's how much he loves us. And he chose us in him. You see, we were born of the first Adam. We were in the first Adam. And it's because we were in the first man, Adam. All men come from Adam. When Adam left the garden paradise, we all left with him. Because we're all born of Adam. But you see, we're born again of the last Adam, as Paul describes Jesus. He's the last Adam. We're born again of him. And so in the same way that we left paradise with the first Adam, we re-enter in through the last Adam. How do we re-enter? Through love, through grace, through forgiveness. That's what the resurrection was about. He's, it was, it was, Jesus went into the grave. Okay, so what? A man goes into the grave. How do we know that God has forgiven us? Because that man walked out of the grave. That's how we know he's forgiven us. Amen? That's how we know. And when, when he walked out of that grave, we all walk out with him. Every single one of us who believe in the one the Father has sent. Blessed is he who believes, Jesus says. Blessed is he with all the riches of Christ Jesus. He predestined us to adoption as, through Jesus Christ to himself. Accord, listen, according to the kind intention of his will. What's his will? That we have eternal life. That's the will of God. It's not to condemn us. It's not to throw us into a fiery hell. It's not to judge us and say, you know, no. That's what happens when we reject him because we're all headed in that direction. But he's saying... Come with me. Come with me. We're all predestined for hell. Every single one of us, when we were born, were predestined for hell. But we can be predestined for heaven. How? Through the last Adam. You're on a train. You're headed to Dallas, Texas, right? If you're on that train, where are you predestined? For Dallas, Texas. So what must you do to be predestined to St. Louis. If you want to be predestined to St. Louis, what must you? You must switch trains. <laughs> You've got to get off the train that's predestined to Dallas and get on the train that's predestined to, to <laughs> St. Louis. The, the, the illustration here, you're predestined to hell. You can be predestined. It's your choice to be predestined to heaven. You just got to switch trains, right? That's all you must do. You got to switch trains. And here's the deal. To him, to the praise and the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him. In him. That's repeated 13 times, I believe. 13 times in this single chapter. In him. In Jesus. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Now here's another thing that we... We, we have a tendency to think is that God, in his predestination, we, we have a tendency to think that God chose Ronnie, but he's rejected Brian. Or he's chose Glenn, but he's re rejected Charlie. That's not the way it works. That's not the, we can all pre, be predestined to heaven because it's in him. That's the phrase we see repeated over and over and over again in this book of, of Ephesians, first chapter of, of Ephesians. In him, in him, in him. You see, there's only one, one that God chooses. He doesn't choose Brian and reject Charlie. 
There's only one that he chooses. Just as we all come from Adam, we all re-enter through one. See, God's not picking and choosing who's going to heaven. He, it's his will for all of us to go to heaven. Today, your name is written in the book of life. Every single, one, every single person that's in this room, every single person that's living or listening over Facebook, every single one of you, your name is written in the book of life because that's God's will. Now, if you reject Jesus, it's erased. It's removed from the book of life. It's not, you know, because we read the book of Revelation, and I will erase your name from the book of life. We hear that over and over again. It's not as if, well, uh, I got saved, my name's written in. Oh, he's messed up, and it's erased. No, it's already there. But if you go through your life rejecting Jesus, it's at that point that it's erased. The question is, do you want your name to, be, to remain written in the book of life? Again, God chooses one. He said from the holy mountain, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. He's only pleased with one, and that's his son. And it's in him that we have redemption. It's in him that we have all the riches of heaven. It's in him that we have res the resurrected life. He rose from the grave. He's in the presence of the Father. We can all boldly enter into the presence of the Father through Him. But do you believe? Do you believe? I had another section of written here. Oh, never mind. <laughs> this morning, if you've had this superficial belief, if you've had this theological belief. Well, if I believe in Jesus, then I'm going to heaven. Well, even the demons believed in Jesus. The question is, do you believe and embrace the promise of Jesus that you have the forgiveness of, him, of sin, that you are going to heaven? That's the question. Even the demons believe. That's why Paul says, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that he has risen from the dead, you shall be saved. Confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. Now, there, there's, there's an interesting phrase there. Jesus is Lord. What does that mean? That means that he's the boss, he's the master, he's the leader of your life. He's the controller of your life. See, many of us are controlled by our feelings and emotions, and that's, a, that's why there's so much hysteria when it comes to the coronavirus, because it's our feelings and our emotions. We're seeing these things happen. We're not really believing in our God, and our Lord, and our Savior. So we're operating in fear. That's be, he's believed that Jesus is, or confess Jesus to be Lord, Master, Controller of your life. And also that God raised him from the dead. God, God raised him from the dead. What does that mean? To be raised from the dead? That he has forgiven sin. Confess him as Lord and believe in your heart that he's forgiven you. Then you shall be saved. In the midst of terror, you can be saved. So uh, this morning, as we wrap this up, I want to give you an opportunity to confess Jesus as Lord. I want to give you an opportunity to receive Him as your Savior. To believe in the resurrection, that there is a resurrected life in Him. As the worship team comes forward, well, I'm going to ask this question. I'm going to ask you to just raise your hand. Raise your hand if you've uh, truly believed, chosen to receive Jesus as Lord. Everyone bow your heads just for a moment. And I'm going to ask you to raise your hand to receive Jesus the Lord. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your foot. <laughs> I see your hand. And your hand. And your hand. Jesus, I confess with your mouth. I see your hand and yours. Jesus said, if you confess with your mouth, and that's what I'm going to give you an opportunity, confess Jesus with your mouth. We're going to say a quick little prayer here. And if you've raised your hand, if, you've, uh, if you're hearing this on Facebook, remember there's no um, formula for salvation. It's belief in Jesus Christ that saves you. So there's no special formula. 
But we're going to say a prayer. And if you say that prayer and you mean it in your heart, you too can be saved. So I'll give you that opportunity this morning. And everyone pray with me so that we're not singling anyone out. Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for, for, for uh, putting it down just a little bit wrong. Thank you for, uh, for salvation. Thank you for forgiving my sin. I receive your forgiveness today. I make you master of my life. I will follow after you. And not after my feelings, my emotions, my own beliefs. I will believe in your word. And I thank you for the peace that you give to me today. It's your son's name I pray. Amen. God bless you guys. We have a baptism sign up if uh, you've said that for the first time and you've, you've believed it. Jesus said, be baptized to, to, uh, to make, make a public profession. And baptism is the way to make that public profession. So if you confess Jesus with the Lord with your mouth, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, you can be saved. Make a public profession of that today. Get signed up. As we go through the double doors, there's a, there's a sign up list on the left hand side. I encourage you to sign up. And then we'll, Ronnie will get busy on the Baptist, baptistry, <laughs> and hopefully we'll get you baptized here soon. Um, let's all stand up with one final song as we uh, lift up our voices to the Lord. Stone's been rolled away and there's an empty grave and it's a new day. Stone's been rolled away and there's an empty grave and it's a new day. Jesus is alive, he's alive and it's a new day. Jesus is alive, he's alive and it's a new day. Met him on Took away my fears and it's a new day I saw him in the garden when he wiped away my tears and it's a new day Jesus is alive, he's alive and it's a new day Jesus is alive, he's alive and it's a new day, yeah, yeah. I meet him in the sky when he comes to take me home. It's a new day. I meet him in the clouds where he leads me to his throne. And it's a new day. Jesus is alive, he's alive. It's a new day. Yeah, yeah. It's a new day. Brand new day. God bless you all.